Good afternoon. Um, my name is Frederick Simons, and I'll be talking to you today about promoting sparsity and localization in geophysical inverse problems. Before I go on, I should really apologize for not being able to be here in person. I'll see you tomorrow. This is why I cannot be here live, but I hope this works for you. Also, before I go on, I should acknowledge my various past and present uh, collaborators. I don't work in a vacuum. I will not list them all, but I'm just going to say that some of my mentors' um, uh, influences in this uh, work, some of my contemporaries, particularly for this presentation, Ignace Loris in Brussels and Mark Wazorek in Paris, and some of my postdocs, Chris Harrig in particular, uh, about the work I'll present today, and then some graduate students and undergraduates that have all had a hand in helping me do my work. Uh, as they say, of course, all of the mistakes are mine. Um, when I was thinking about what to specifically present to you for uh, these 30 minutes or so, I uh, made a quick list of the main topics that I'm really interested in. And this is starting with things of uh, lithospheric magnetic structure of the terrestrial planets. We've done some work on Mars. We've looked at the terrestrial lithospheric magnetic field. We are going to look at some other planets soon. Um, I have been interested for a long time in lithospheric elastic structure, such as we can derive from topography and gravity, developing statistical and inverse modeling techniques to extract the elastic rheology of the shallow lithosphere. Um, I've been doing uh, instrumentation development to close the coverage gap in uh, seismic tomography. Most of the Earth's seismic broadband instruments are on land. We have some ocean islands, we have some ocean bottom seismometers, but ultimately the oceans are a vast uncovered area. And I've been, I've been involved in both the mermaid and the sun and mermaid projects, which are uh, intending to close this gap with some exciting results. Uh, we've studied large earthquakes from space using time variable gravity. Surprisingly, they show up very well in uh, the gravity field. And they, uh, the study using the gravity field gives us complementary information about the earthquake mechanism in uh, the best of cases. I've also looked at sea level rise uh, as a data driven geophysical inverse problem. And uh, I've also looked at, and I will be talking today about, polar ice loss, once again from time variable satellite gravity, and in particular focused on the waning ice mass of and around Greenland. So this is one of the case studies that I'll be presenting you today. And then lastly, I've been for a long time involved in, in uh, wavelet analysis for time series and seismograms in a particular context of early warning analysis. But in what I'll be showing you today, there will be wavelet analysis applied in a different context, namely in a three-dimensional, volumetric, spherical context in order to help us parameterize the um, interior structure of the Earth. And so in my second case study today, I'll be showing you some results on how to uh, harness the power of wavelet transforms to determine, analyze, represent, and invert for seismic Earth structure in the context of geophysical seismic tomography. So when I look at all these various topics, I see my common thread is really the study of the solid Earth and of the lithosphere in particular, the uppermost several hundred kilometers of the Earth and uh, planets. And the three mainstream divisions are, of course, observations. We've been looking at gravity, magnetics, topography, but of course also at the seismic wave field generated by earthquakes and the seismoacoustic wave field which is how teleseismic earthquakes, after they convert at the ocean bottom, map into acoustic pressure variations, which we are recording using these mobile oceanographic devices that uh, I have been and continue to develop, the Son and Mermaid project, about which I will say very little today. Theory and methods uh, figure big in all of these endeavors because when we have a lot of data, as we do, we have a lot of satellite data, we have a lot of digital seismic data, we do need the best, the most powerful, the most performant inversion methods, and we need to study the results robustly, statistically. And for those, the concepts of sparsity and localization that I have in the title are going to be featuring prominently. 
And then, of course, interpretation and the broader impacts of these research studies are, well, how do we present and analyze our results, results uh, scientifically and interact with broader communities of scientists, planetary scientists, uh, in particular geologists, geochemists, geodynamicists, um, which I do by either working with them or also remotely and distantly by uh, leaving behind uh, lots and lots of reproducible research in the form of software that people have been uh, taken advantage of to uh, tackle some of their own research problems. So the two words here, sparsity and localization, and then the third word, inverse problems, that I had in my title. What is sparsity? Well, sparsity is really about efficiently representing data and efficiently analyzing data and models. For me, the sparsity, or for us, the sparsity doesn't just exist. Sometimes we have to bring it out. And what I mean by that is that natural processes, geophysical, geological data may have an innate sparsity that we, however, need to discover by perhaps choosing, or as I have been developing and constructing an appropriate mathematical basis for the representation and the analysis. Not everything is sparse in every basis, and sometimes we make dedicated bases to bring out this sparsity. And you'll see later that this viewpoint of trying to represent and analyze data in the best basis possible is something that really uh, features uh, prominently throughout my research. Well, what is localization? And localization is about looking in the right place. Um, ultimately, we're all geologists. We look at the Earth and we look at the planets and we are in a particular space domain or in a particular time domain when we look at time series or we, when we look at uh, climate records, for instance. But we're also in a particular spectral domain because energy of signals of geophysics or uh, geological data lives in a particular frequency domain. And measurement devices are inherently always band limited. Computation always stops short of infinity and stops at a certain bandwidth. So there is always just a limited range of frequencies that we can resolve. And localization for us is really to try and find the area of time or space and spectral space in which our signal to noise is really high, in which our measurements are really reliable, and in which we can make useful predictions and explanations of the available data. So that's localization in a signal processing sense. And then in terms of inverse problems, this is about explaining data, which is ultimately a statistical operation, not just an optimization. It's no longer just about finding the best model, but also about characterizing the uncertainty around it, perhaps finding entire classes of models, entire families of models that all equivalently explain the data, and then making inference, drawing inference from these uh, ensembles to say something useful about the Earth and planets. And so here, too, to put both sparsity and localization via the development of these either mathematical bases or particular ways of zooming into the right time frequency or spatial spectral domain, to put that all into the context of geophysical inverse theory, that is where we develop the algorithms to be able to do that. So the two case studies that I'm going to uh, present to you today, one of them relates to Greenland. How much and where and when has Greenland been melting? If we look at the literature in the past decade, the answers, the quantitative numbers of how much ice mass has been lost off the Greenland ice sheet due to presumably global warming, um, the answers have been all over the place. Lots of estimates have been produced, and their uncertainties don't always overlap. Remote sensing is one class of observations that is used for this. Well, their problems are, of course, that it only sees the top of the ice sheets. Uh, uh, field campaigns with GPS or, or, or uh, ice penetrating radar are inherently spotty because it requires us to go in places and we can't be everywhere comprehensively. And then the big promise of the last decade has really been satellite gravity because that really, as a gravitational measure, gives us an integrated uh, estimate of the mass directly that is being lost off the uh, polar ice sheets. 
But there the problems have been that the satellites, of course, fly at an altitude, the data is noisy, and so far the results have been mixed in terms of looking pretty blurry and also having large uncertainties. And this is exactly what we're going to try and address here in the next 10 minutes. So answers being all over the place ultimately is not very good for the public perception of science. People do not like to hear that the answer could be 100 or 200 or something that is uncertain. Um, we are here not going to claim that we don't have uncertainty, but we're going to try and model the uncertainty, and we're going to try and embrace the uncertainty to not only understand why estimates are different, but also make new estimates and appraise their uncertainty in an interpretive framework. Uh, and once again, sparsity and localization and the statistical inverse uh, uh, approaches are going to help us in this endeavor specifically to do a mass balance for Greenland over the last decade. GRACE is the satellite mission that uh, delivers time variable gravity to us. The acronym is uh, Gravity uh, Recovery and Climate Experiment. And when we look at the document by which the mission was proposed, it reads that it will precisely measure the planet's shifting water masses and map their effects on the Earth's gravity field, yielding new information on the effects of global climate change. How does it do it? Well, it has a twin satellite setup. So there's two identical satellites that measure their evolving distance between them to the width of a tenth of a human hair. They're doing it at an altitude of five, four, four hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface, and the separation between the satellites is on the order of 200 kilometers. And the principle is very simple. When there is a mass anomaly on its orbit, the leading satellite will experience it first, increasing the distance, and the trailing satellite will experience it next. It'll catch up. And so this very noisy, oscillating time series of the inter-satellite distance is ultimately, when it's linked to their uh, attitude and position measure measurements along the orbit, gives us a measure of the evolving potential difference between the satellites and the reference model by which we can map the Earth's gravity field. This ranging system, this microwave ranging system, this K-band, is so sensitive that it can detect these separation changes as about 10 microns. But these mission specifics are really not all that we should stare at. The, the question really is, well, these are measurements, but how do these measurements translate into uncertainties on the models once we have reduced them, interpreted, inverted them in terms of, let's say, evolving mass distribution at the surface of the Earth? Uh, having 10 micron accuracy of a, a separation is really meaningless unless we ask the question, well, over what time scale, over what spatial scale, and over what spectral scale, in what wavelength bands do we expect this type of resolution? So this is where this sort of signal processing concept of space, time, and spectral resolution, we need to sort of go look in a space here where we can expect to get good accuracy for our models. A couple of examples of how widely the models have varied. Here, three papers from 2006, and this is the first one. This is a map here of uh, Greenland's mass loss over a period of about three to four years. And we're seeing a dominant loss of mass from Greenland. But as you can see, it spills over into the oceans. And then there's gains of masses left and right, east and west of Greenland. And the authors write that, well, this is clearly not a perfect picture. It's also a very early picture. And we see leakage. We see the signal present in an area over the ocean where there certainly is no ice mass loss because there wasn't any ice to begin with. And they attribute this to probably some processing artifacts, notably the filtering applied to suppress noise in the high degree and high order spherical harmonics, which I'll talk, tell you more about. Same year, very different method. Velikonia and War tried to uh, estimate the average mass loss over Greenland. And in this picture here, we're seeing this from 2002-ish to 2006 in a bit. And we're seeing on a month-by-month -month basis the evolving weight of the Greenland ice sheet up and down 
but overall mostly down. And interpreting that single linear trend here through this data as, and I quote here, entirely due to a change in ice, and then subtracting leakage, in other words, they developed a procedure to combat some of this spillover into areas where it shouldn't be, the signal, the ice volume decrease is inferred to be about 240 cubic kilometers per year. So that's 240 gigatons of ice per year is lost over this decade, as reported in 2006. Another paper in 2006 uses, once again, a third method to look at this type of time variable gravity data. And they concluded, by a judicious projection of the signal into individual hydrological basins that are numbered here on this graph, this is Scott Lethke et al., and they come up with a total of about 100 gigatons per year in roughly the same observational epoch. Now that number, as they note, is a factor too smaller than the recent grace-based trend determined in the same year by Velikony and War from the same data. And you can also see that the uncertainties don't overlap. So in around 2006, it was clear that Grace's view of mass loss over, Antar over Antarctica and Greenland, Greenland here, was so uncertain that uh, from the same data with different techniques, people would come up with values, estimates of average mass loss trends over multiple years, over entire continents that were a factor of two, if not more, different. So uh, what's up with that? It's all the same data. What, what explains these discrepancies? There's, of course, a lot that goes into the model, but nothing that really fundamentally differs between the uh, different groups. What goes in is literally just satellite orbits and potential differences in altitude and um, the physics of it. What needs to also be modeled is the instantaneous elastic structure of the Earth through the use of love numbers about which there is relatively uh, little disagreement. There is a very important component of uh, m modeling the ongoing viscoelastic longer time scales of post-glacial rebounds from the last time that the Earth was deglaciation, deglaciating. And while the models there differ, when we use the same models, with, um, we should get the same results. And in the papers that I showed you, even if the same post-glacial rebounds uh, models were used, the results still differed by factors that were too large to be good. So fundamentally, the issue is something about statistics. The authors of these three papers here, they took different choices. They dealt with leakage, spillover into areas, with smoothing, with filtering, with noise reduction, with averaging in fundamentally different ways. And ultimately, this is about how statistical information that is either known or can be known um, inherent in these uh, data delivered by the satellite, how to turn that into a model and to use that uh, uh, in, in our interpretation. So I'll just mention a few words here. It's either pixel-based in the space ba uh, area, it's either by mass cons, which are a particular sort of basis functions, or it's in the general domain of spherical harmonics. All the choices made of the bases influence our results, and we need to know why and how. So I mentioned spherical harmonics. Well, what are they? They're just basis functions, but they're global basis functions. YLM is a spherical harmonic that lives on the surface of the sphere. This is an element out of an orthonormal basis on the entire sphere. The L is a degree, which gives us a wavelength. The M is an order, which gives us a distribution of this pattern across and about the spherical surface. And the orthonormality means that if we take two different ones and integrate their product over the sphere, it's zero, and if it's the same, it's one. So orthonormality is a big deal to represent scalar signals such as potential difference on the surface of a, a globe because we uh, expand the signal here, S of R, as an infinite series of weighting coefficients, SLM, times these basis functions. Of course, the band limitation means that we can never go to infinity, so this is always present here that we truncate the sum at a particular maximum spherical harmonic degree, which I'll be calling the bandwidth. Now what the real problem is with spherical harmonics is that they're orthogonal, they're a good basis, but only for global processes. And once we start looking at smaller domains, such as, say, just Greenland, or just a polar cap, or just a latitudinal band, this orthogonality is lost. 
we take two spherical harmonics and we only have a limited integration area available, then we no longer get the ones or zeros, the Kronecker deltas for the same or different uh, spherical harmonics. But we get some operator that is not a diagonal operator. But what we can do with that operator is we can take that and find its eigenfunctions. And when we do, we get, again, an orthogonal basis, which is now a very useful property of being a suitable basis both for the limited region and still for the entire globe, which is what we do by forming the eigenfunctions of that loss of orthogonality operator. And those new functions, which is underlying a lot of our work in the last decades, those are called slepping functions. They're uh, given the symbol G, they live on the sphere, they're linear combinations of spherical harmonics that optimally target a specific spatial area of the globe and a particular spectral range of interest. So to cut a very long story short, I'm going to give you the result of what it results in when we take all of the GRACE data, the hundred or so monthly solutions since 2002, and year by year, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, invert these data for the best fitting equivalent water mass as a surface density change here. Essentially, we're weighing the weight of the ice sheet and we're seeing how, where, and when the volume of ice is reduced. And we're seeing very interesting patterns here at very high spatial and temporal resolution. Ultimately, we're using the entire degree 60 spherical harmonics, which is a technical detail, which means that we have a lot of spatial resolution. But we're confined to Greenland, so we do not have this uh, leakage. And we're seeing individual areas of predominant mass loss that are presumably correlated with individual large outlet glaciers. And then we're seeing always, also in this uh, decade, in the interior, in the highlands, uh, a, an increased mass because despite the overall mass going down, there is still a continued, if not increased, precipitation um, in the highlands that leads to a net accumulation of ice mass in those areas. The int values here are the value of the integral over the uh, uh, Greenland area, and so all these terms here are negative, which means that overall, on a year-by-year -year basis, we are losing these numbers here in terms of centimeters per year. When we put all of that together, we get the by now very well-known overall average trend and including some um, higher order terms which will tell us what the value of the acceleration is in this mass loss. Our best fitting slope here is about 200 gigatons per year, uh, which is ultimately back in agreement with um, uh, most recent studies because it's ultimately the averages are converging, but I showed you we have a lot more spatial and temporal resolution now. And the acceleration term is a relatively modest 10 gigaton per year squared of acceleration in mass loss, which is not nearly as dramatic as was reported in 2009 and 6 and 7 um, on the basis of less complete data and of a less ideal modeling procedure. So what I think I learned from using these best bases, these spherically concentrated slepping bases, is that we can really study the uncertainty, we can really do the projection onto an efficient sparse basis, and we can use this localization in space and in the spectrum to get to an overall trend, to get a quantitative and well-resolved robust estimate of the potential acceleration terms, and we end up with numbers of about 200 gigatons per year. And of course, every year of an additional observation uh, year uh, ultimately does a lot to reduce our uncertainty. Um, we get maps using these functions. So our sparsity is that only 10 or 11 of these new slepping functions matter in constructing the overall patterns. But each of them is a map, and so we get detailed spatial and temporal information. And these maps now are, are ready to be quantitatively interpreted. Now we can go back and look at remote sensing operations. We can go back and look at field campaigns and try to target quantitatively what portions of the ash sheets are melting where and when. And increasingly, we haven't done the full analysis yet, but increasingly the rates and the patterns that we see are comparing well with some of these spot surveys 
which um, uh, have been conducted and continue to be conducted uh, on the Greenland ice sheet. And of course now we've moved to Antarctica for our modeling. Now I'm going to give you another example of sparsity and localization and this time for global seismic tomography. No longer the surface of the earth from gravity but the interior of the earth from how the seismic wave field gets distorted starting with an earthquake mapping the full waveform how these seismograms get influenced by the Earth's structure by the time they get recorded by the earthquake, by the uh, station. Um, uh, the modeling effort is therefore to explain the seismic wave field in terms of Earth structure, the interior of it. Well, the future of tomography is going to involve many, many data types, including those ocean acoustic ones that I was talking about earlier, the sauna mermaid um, floating devices that I've been developing. It's going to require fast and demanding calculation and storage of complex 2D, 3D kernels by which the sensitivity of the particular measurement to a volumetric uh, portion of the Earth structure is accurately represented physically. And it's going to ever uh, demand larger and larger scale simulations and inversions, um, as you are well aware here in this department. And on the other end, on the receiving end of these models here, uh, we uh, will need to mine them for information. We will need to learn something about the Earth from them through statistical analysis, through resolution assessment, and through data mining to see what really, what type of geodynamical or geological uh, processes these pictures of the Earth ultimately tell us about the structure and evolution of it. So if this is going to be global tomography as is being done, all over the globe. It's going to be done on a sphere, you know, on a ball, in other words, and it's going to involve data sets that will be high frequency, low frequency, there'll be ray theory, there'll be, there'll be um, um, uh, finite frequency. In other words, it's going to be multi, many, and mixed resolution, uh, uh, both in time and in space. So a very brief primer on the usual way of doing things, the data D that's collected is going to be some function, let's call it a linear function, of some unknown model and then there'll be noise. And the age-old solution is to try and find the best fitting solution that explains the data in some least square sense that will minimize the data misfit and that's maximizing the data fit that should be subject to some quadratic constraint to help regularize the solution to help beat it into stable behavior. And the regularization is typically done using some other quadratic penalty on some properties of the model. Lately, however, there's been a whole new field of what's called compressed sensing, which is a long story, and I'll just give you one or two uh, points of it, is that we're going to be maximizing, once again, the data fit, minimizing data misfit, but subject to constraints of sparsity. So if I write this down in one word, in one line here, it'll be minimizing the misfit, how well we explain the data using our models under the action of the operator, which could be the wave field, is in other words, our measurement, plus a penalty term that really just penalizes the number of pieces of information. So in the Greenland gravity um, study, we had about 10 odd slumping functions. Here we don't know yet what they are, but we're trying to explain the data using a small set of components. So what's sparsity again is whatever is whatever there are very few components of. And this L0 norm, which is numbers or counts the number of important components, can be replaced by a, a better behaved L1 norm, which is the sum of the absolute values of the expansion coefficients, which is an important but uh, ultimately technical detail. And what we're going to use in terms of turning our models into a sparse set of uh, basis functions is by wavelet transformation. The sparsity there is because even though we map all of the data to a whole set of wavelets, most of them are going to be unimportant. And it's our job to try and find which ones are important. So the signal or the model will be transformed via wavelet transform and then thresholded such that most of the information will be concentrated into a small set of components. Um, I'm almost out of time here, so I'm going to just give you 
a very quick tour of how we map the volume the, of the Earth through a cubed sphere, which is a spherical to Cartesian mapping onto specific patches of the Earth's surface, how we make dedicated wavelets on those patches, and we can use some well-known algorithms for this. This is an example of a Dobushi 4 wavelet at different scales, so the footprints get smaller and smaller. And we analyze a lot of Earth models to ascertain, to begin with, that Earth models really are sparse in this sense. In other words, if you take a picture of an Earth model on the left here, this is a P-wave speed anomaly model from uh, Montelli, and then we put it through this wavelet transform, and then we throw 95% of the numbers away, we still get a beautiful reconstruction of the same Earth, which shows us, and we can track this in detail, that we really should be trying to target about 5% of the available solutions to the inverse problem in order to represent the data very well. And our quest, of, of course, is, well, what does that 5% mean for the study of the Earth, and how do we find it? We've written a, a, a very recent paper on analyzing the scalings of heterogeneity. I'm going to skip over this for you including the uh, ratios of P-wave compressional to shear wave speeds, which is something that mineral physicists are interested in because it tells us the um, importance of chemical versus thermal heterogeneity inside the Earth. And really what we've been focusing on lately is to try to solve this inverse problem. It's one, way, one thing to know that the Earth is really sparse after a wavelet basis. It's another thing to know how to do it and solve it. But really the inverse problem is about collecting data and explaining, finding the Earth model finding exactly where the information needs to um, be represented by this small set, localized, sparse set of coefficients. So let's solve this inverse problem. Whichever the forward model, whether they're ray paths or banana donuts, sensitivity kernels, finite frequency or single frequency, the data will be noisy, and we're going to use our wavelet transform to sparsify it. And so this has been our goal. And we've succeeded in developing algorithms to explain data under the action here of the tomographic uh, operator by f and finding the model S hat here for the truth S by combined minimization of this quadratic and this L1 misfit norm here of the wavelet transform of the uh, Earth model itself in space. And I'll skip over the detailed results of the, f of the synthetic experiments to conclude that this is very much work in progress, very much work that I'm excited to take further because, as I said, the data keeps growing. The computational capabilities and the physical way of properly mapping Earth structure to uh, um, uh, observations and vice versa is ever getting better. And I'll conclude by saying that I've just tried to squeeze into these 30 minutes, a handful of key ideas that are sort of applied mathematics or signal processing, these concepts of sparsity, localization, and, and, and sort of a statistical approach to inversion problems to apply, which they do very well, to the study of the Earth's gravity field, by which we have some very nice new observation about the uh, ice melting over glaciated regions, things that we started in Greenland and are taken to other areas. Um, and these varsity promoting inversion algorithms using these new bases are going to be ever more prominent in uh, helping us tackle large, large multi-resolution seismic tomographic problems, which are the future of this uh, um, branch of science here. Thank you very much.